Okay, welcome back. Having talked about in the last lecture the kind of general overview of the autonomic nervous system and looking specifically at the, the kind of sympathetic and parasympathetic arms of that, um, we are now going to move on and look at it in relation to some as aspects of the sensory systems as well to get an understanding of the sort of neuronal and neuropharmacological aspects of that sort of system, if you like. So, what we're talking about here are really have been referred to as the non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic transmissions parts of the system. So these used to be referred as to the NENC or even just the NANCY um, nerves. So these are you know, obviously noradrenaline and acetylcholine, sympathetic and parasympathetic are two of the key neurotransmitters within the, the body controlling autonomic function. But they are not the only neurotransmitters that are released into the periphery to have an effect on autonomic function. There are other neurotransmitters and neurotransmitter systems involved. And this PowerPoint today is just a very brief overview of those, a kind of general introduction. It's only about another dozen or so slides, so it's not, we're not going into it in any great depth, but it's a kind of jumping off point for you to go and find out and do a bit more background reading. But also, if you look at the lectures that are to come, we will be referring back to some of these neurotransmitters that we're going to talk about in the next few slides. So, the thing about these NENC or non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic neurotransmitters, there's a number of them and they mediate the sensory and motor functions within the autonomic nervous system. So what we're going to then do is just have a look at what we mean when, you know, this was often, I mean, going way back, I mean, go back to when I first did pharmacology. I, I studied pharmacology 1980 to 1984, so well over 30 years ago now. And at that time, we'd obviously, we knew about the, the ad, adrenergic, noradrenergic systems. We knew about the cholinergic. But there were a number of neurotransmitter systems, which at the time, there wasn't a great deal of clarity as to what transmitter was actually involved. And that's where this term came. It's a neurotransmitter, there's also some, obviously some sort of control going on there, but it's neither noradrenergic nor cholinergic, and this is where the NENC term came in. And then obviously the research and development over the years has helped us identify and get a greater understanding of what these neurotransmitters actually are. <coughs> so we're talking about things like nitric oxide. 5-HT or serotonin, histamine. The little left numbers here are just to show the specific subtype of receptor that's implicated. So serotonin works in a number of different receptors, so therefore we're talking really about 5-HT3 receptors, that particular subclass. Similarly with histamine, there are a number of H or histamine receptors. We're talking specifically about histamine acting on H2. Now, nitric oxide, what physiological effect does that have? It's an arterial dilator, so it will open up blood vessels. Serotonin activates sensory nerves. Histamine increases gastric acid secretion. They've all got very specific physiological roles. We've got a number of different antagonist drugs that will block these receptors. And so therefore you'll see the value of these, obviously, you know, nitric oxide synthase inhibitors. These, this term here, nitric oxide synthase, nitric oxide synthase is the enzyme that supports the synthesis of nitric oxide. If you block that, you get a reduction in nitric oxide levels. Then we've got ondansetron, which is a 5-HT3 antagonist. And that will reduce the activity and the firing of the sensory nerves. And we'll come on in a minute to talk about the value of that type of drug. And then drugs like Zantac or Tagamet, they're antagonists at histamine too, and they'll actually decrease gastric acid secretion. So therefore, Zantac, if you think about it, for gastric reflux, etc., these are useful compounds. So the sensory nerves are basically providing information that's going to go up to the brain as part of this whole nervous system. And what they're doing is they're, these nerves are monitoring the activity of the viscera, the internal organs, sending information to the brain about them. 
they're also allowing us to respond to changes in those, in those organs and also responses from external stimuli. So it's basically about monitoring what's going on inside the body and sending up information to the brain. So therefore that's why they're being referred to as afferent neurons. Afferent means sending signals in the direction of the brain as opposed to the ones that are efferent, which are carrying the signal from the brain. So afferent to, efferent away from. So what we've got here is just to show you some examples of the autonomic, the reflexes that are going on. We've got a number of different systems. So what we've talked about before, we looked at this aspect. Neurons firing from the brain, sympathetic, parasympathetic, to come down and have an effect on a part of the body. Might be the heart, might be the lungs, might be the gut, etc, etc. What we're now talking about is those nerves that are sending the information to the brain in the first place. The sensory nerves, these afferent sensory neurons that are firing up to the brain, giving information to the brain about what's happening both in, inside the body and allowing the brain to respond and give the appropriate command out through the sympathetic and parasympathetic outflows. These nerves are encouraged or stimulated to fire through the action of receptors. Now, we've already used the term receptor. We've talked about receptors for drugs and neurotransmitters. Those are receptors which are a binding site for a chemical agent to bind with. <clears throat> so we're talking, we've talked about ligand-gated receptors, G-protein coupled receptors, kinase-linked receptors, and we've also talked about the nuclear receptors. The term receptor here is slightly, is, is used in a slightly different way. So we have chemoreceptors, which are stimulated or become sensitised to chemical changes, mechanoreceptors, which become stimulated in response to activity or movement, nociceptors, which are pain. So nociception is pain, so nociceptors respond to pain. And then we have the thermoreceptors, which, as the name implies, are monitoring extremes of heat and cold and sending information up to the brain. So, the sensory nerves, that's not usually where we're targeting the drug because they're kind of non-specific things. The only exception to that would be when you give local anaesthetic and that blocks the sensory nerves sending up nociceptive signals. And also, we talked about the, the role of you know, the um, 5-HT in the sensory neurons and we talked about them, they're involved in sending the signal up to the brain and involved in emesis, so we can get in there, interfere with those ones when we want an anti-emetic reaction. Now, emesis is normally a protective uh, event. That is something toxic has come into our body and we are sick. The emetic action happens as a way of cleansing the body, getting rid of what's causing the problem. However, it can stop becoming a if you like a protective mechanism. So for example with chemotherapy, you know, that's a toxic chemical. But you know the if you like the, the emetic effect of those is a kind of necessary evil. You know, but you don't there's no advantage to the person being sick all the time, thinking, oh there's a toxic chemical in my body, I need to get rid of it. So you can block the action. It's a bit like, you know, pain is a protective mechanism. But if you know pain is going to happen, or it's chronic pain, there is no advantage to the body to continually be aware of that pain. So therefore, that's why we need pain relief, and that's why we utilise pain relief. So, local anaesthetics will block all sensation. So those sensory neurons are sending up nociceptive signals to the brain. If you give a local anaesthetic, the local anaesthetic will block the sodium channels in, in the nerves. And what that will do is the neuron will no longer be able to open up the sodium channel to get the depolarization phase. So if you think of an action potential, looking like that, this phase here is caused by the influx of sodium. This phase here is caused by 
the influx of the sorry the efflux of potassium. If you use a local anaesthetic and you block the sodium channel, this doesn't happen. You don't get the depolarization. Therefore, you don't get the action potential firing the nociceptive signal in the direction of the brain. And as a result of that, you get analgesia or a loss of the sensation. This one here looks a bit at the, the, if you like, the, the, the pathways, etc., that are involved in the mesis. Now, this might be quite small. Um, I'm just going to take a wee stroll around the back of the camera here so I can see myself how it looks. Yeah, it does look a bit small for you. What I would probably advise you to do with this diagram is get it printed off as a single PowerPoint slide just on one sheet of A4 so that you can really appreciate the detail of what is actually going on. So if I come back to it and start to point you in the right direction though, what we're looking at here is you've got the vomiting centre that's going to control the emetic reflex causing retching, vomiting and therefore that's the way of getting that toxin that we spoke about or that irritant out of the system. Okay, so there's your, there's your toxin or your drug, whatever that's going to cause the problem. That goes into the blood. Once it's in the blood, it can go in through, pass around the body, go to the cerebrospinal fluid, and it can stimulate the CTZ chemoreceptor trigger zone in the area postrema of the brain. Once that becomes stimulated, that in turn sends a signal down. So it's this signal down here, the big line right down the middle there, to the vomiting centre. That switches on the emetic reflex. Now, the other things that can stimulate the vomiting centre are pain and also the signals from the cardiovascular system. So that's why if someone experiences severe angina or a heart attack and extreme pain from the, as a result of the cardiovascular event, there can be vomiting to go with it. The other thing that happens is that you get the, 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 the stimulus from the toxin up here that's going to activate the chemoreceptor trigger zone that will also be picked up in the gut and that will send a signal to the vagus which will send a signal to the vomiting centre which will cause the same effect. So there's multiple ways but all of them feed. One, two, three, four arrows all pointing to the vomiting centre there. So what you're looking to do then is, is there any way that you can stop or block that stimulation there? so that you no longer get the retching. Because the retching and the vomiting will make you feel nauseous. And that becomes a vicious circle. Because if you're feeling nauseous, that can actually increase the likelihood of you being sick again. You're sick again, you're more nauseous, you're sick again, and so on and so forth. Now, taking a step back a couple of slides, we did say that the whole purpose of the emetic action was seen as very much a protective element stop you feeling nauseous, to stop you, to stop, sorry, to stop you keeping a toxin within your body. However, with radiotherapy and chemotherapy, they can induce vomiting because of the severity of the medication. Now, they're releasing the, the these neurons that we saw firing are releasing the, the NANC transmitter serotonin. And that serotonin acts on 5-HT3 receptors on the vagus that we talked about, and that's where the stimulus comes from to, to initiate that vomiting reflex. So, if 5-HT3 receptors are implicated, if you can give 5-HT3 receptor antagonists, they can be effective in reducing the mimetic effect that you get with these cytotoxic chemicals. Now, these are often given in a prophylactic fashion. So rather than give someone chemotherapy, wait until they start feeling nauseous, start being sick. What you can do is, you can give them the 5-HT3 antagonist and it will start to block the receptor and therefore reduce the likelihood of the emetic response being switched on. So the whole thing is controlled through the vagus from this pathway involving, involving the stimulation of 5-HT serotonin being released working on 5-HT3 receptors and these drugs down the bottom here are 5-HT3 antagonists or blockers. The other things that can be involved in the control of this, we're kind of talking about, I suppose the key term here is homeostasis. It's about the brain receiving signals about what's going on 
and then sending out signals to make the appropriate changes or responses to keep things nice and stable and steady. That's what we mean by this concept of homeostasis. The best ex explanation of homeostasis is the maintenance of a constant internal environment. And that's what we're talking about here. So, so all the things, all the key things in our body, like our blood pressure, our body temperature, our fluid balance, our electrolyte balance, our body, whatever this feel like almost a set point. And if it starts to rise or fall from that set point, then the hypothalamus gets the signals about it and sends out signals down the way to, to affect the appropriate responses. Yeah. So you must get the input going to the hypothalamus and then if, it, if, if these signals start to drift from the normal signals that it's used to getting, it will then send signals which will initiate an EFEM pathway of neuron firing out of the brain down to fix what has changed. So the hypothalamus is receiving inputs from the, you know, the, this, the visceral inputs from the, by the vagus, the retina, the, this um, you know, chemoreceptor trigger zone, CTZ, you know, and, and that we talked about with the emetic response, from the olfactory system, from the, um, you know, basically, I suppose the key thing there is you, you know, you've got, you get sensory information going to the brain. Right? You've also got, you know, receptors in the hypothalamus themselves that are responding to temperature of the blood and the electrolyte concentration of the blood and can affect changes here if you're too hot or too cold or if the fluid electrolyte balance is off. Basically, the hypothalamus, because it links to the pituitary and the pituitary controls the, you know, controls the glands like the adrenal gland, you can then start to control things down the hypothalamus, hypothalamo pituitary adrenal axis, HPA. Blood pressure, body temperature, etc., etc., and even levels of adrenaline within the body through the release of adrenal corticotrophic hormone. So the hypothalamus is really the controlling, the, the master, if you like, of the functions within the body. So basically, the hypothalamus has two main inputs. You've got the neural signals coming from the motor nerves telling you what's happening with heart rate, blood vessel diameter, digestion, etc. And then you've also got endocrine information coming about hormone levels so that you can then send the signals down to readjust heart rate, get it back to set point or normal levels, alter the level, the release of a hormone if there's not enough of it or control it if there's too much of it. So these are all the different pathways and processes that the hypothalamus is linked to. It's also involved in the control of body weight because that's where leptin works. So leptin, the hormone, works in the hypothalamus. Yep. So basically, you know, you've tried to avoid working because the hypothalamus controls so many things. You could think, well, why not go straight to the hypothalamus and get the drugs to work there? Why don't we get the drugs working centrally to do the job? And that'll fix it right at, right at the beginning of things. But actually, because the hypothalamus is sending out so much information everywhere, if you interfere with the hypothalamus directly, there's a greater chance of extreme side effects. Best example of that is the anti-obesity drug Subutramine. Yeah. Now, Subutramine worked by a, a, a action on um, monoamine systems. It did have an action on weight reduction. However, it also had increased cardiovascular events, heart attacks and strokes. So, yes, it may control weight, but there was a great potential for severe cardiovascular damage, and therefore that drug is no longer on the market. So what we've talked about there, just to say, just very briefly, just to touch base on it, is this idea of, although we do focus so much on what noradrenaline is doing and what acetylcholine is doing, i.e. the sympathetic and parasympathetic control, that's all about what's coming out from the, down to the body to control the action. But how do we know what we need to change? That comes through these other neurons that are sending signals to the brain to get the information in there, this sensory arm of the autonomic system. 
So the afferent rather than the efferent. And it's good to remember that there's no point in having efferent fibres coming out of the brain if they're not getting correct information through afferent fibres telling them what they need to do to put things right. Thank you.